All right, we are live, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone for the panelists for being with us tonight in out, the Outlier panel discussion on 2020, a diverse landscape. Uh, thanks for Ever and Outlier for hosting us to have this discussion. Um, we originally had this conversation at Outlier OPF Northeast, um, the virtual event, and uh, we ran out of time and Ever granted us the opportunity to do this again to keep that conversation going. Um, we're, we're, we're joined tonight by our friends, Lulu Picard, Veronica Davis, and Matt Wonderly. Gonna give you, gonna give, give you a minute to introduce yourselves in just a moment here. Um, however, um, let me just check my notes here real quick, I apologize. And also, if you're watching live, thanks for joining us tonight. We know we're the exact same time as the vice presidential debate, but, um, you know, that was poor planning on my part. So thanks for joining us or thanks for watching it on replay. Um, but before we get into it, I want everyone to, get, I want to give everyone a chance and, and we have no time limits at this time. So uh, to introduce themselves. So let's introduce ourselves, um, starting with Veronica. Okay, so um, uh, I am the social media branding and content strategies for the Pad Sound School. We're based in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we are podcast coaches, producers, and consultants. And we also have an online course that teaches people how to start their podcast. And we focus on uh, helping people to build their brands with their podcast. So that's what we do. Here's um, our studio. And we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, so we're YouTubers. I don't like to say that, but I guess I'm, I'm a YouTuber too. And uh, this is the third time I participated in something outlier related. And I am always thrilled. And I always, every time Roger contacts me, I'm like, yes, I'm in. I love what the, the outlier festival stands for. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Veronica. We're excited that you can join us. And I just got very hot. I don't know why. Yeah. Maybe just to be on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, Out Outlier is a great yeah, platform yeah. for us and a great community for us to connect with. So we're mm -hmm. grateful for that. It's how we know each other. Um, next, let's introduce Matt. Go ahead, Matt. We'll introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Matt Wonderly, also from Salt Lake City, but I also tend to call London home. Uh, well, I did before the pandemic. I used to travel back and forth once a month, but uh, that's kind of my second home. But I'm in Salt Lake City right now, and I'm uh, currently the CEO of Publisher Arts, which is a big data and analytics uh, tech startup uh, dealing with telecommunications and entertainment and media. But I'm also a co-host for a, a podcast called Founders Therapy, and that podcast is really dedicated to breaking the mental health stigma uh, and, and, and amongst the entrepreneurial community and really helping build a support group for uh, entrepreneurs and founders uh, that are experiencing anxieties, depressions, uh, ADHD even, and, and stress, right? And so uh, that's been a really exciting experience for us. And we actually had Roger on not too long ago, and his episode will be releasing soon. So I'll uh, have to let you know that's coming out in a couple of weeks, Roger. But um, really excited to be here. I'm, mind, uh, I'm a little bit, I'm a, man, I'm a man of lesser words or fewer words and lesser, I guess, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know about that. Thank you, Matt. Um, and then last but not least, my sister from another mister, Lulu Picard. Hey, man. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lulu. I'm the co-host of 27 podcasts. Just kidding. It's two, but it feels like 27. Um, but they're great. So since 2018, I've, been, I've had the 10K Dollar Day podcast, which is a comedy podcast about luxury travel. And we spend a fake $10,000 every single week in a different city in 24 hours. It is uh, not real advice at all, but it's entertaining. And we now have a 10 minute daily podcast that has taken off and kind of changed our world a little bit, which is amazing. I'm an actor and a writer and a director. And so is my co-host actually, Allison Burns. And we've been part of Outlier for actually a pretty short time, just since January when we were at the Salt Lake City event and met Roger and Ever and Veronica and all other things. And uh, it was great. And then we we kind of hooked up with Ever again at Podfest, I Pod think Fest. in Orlando. Was that the one? Yeah, Podfest mm -hmm. in Orlando. And so, so now we're 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 part of the family, and happy, happy, happy to be here. So, 
this is a great conversation. I'm excited that we have the space to have it. I'm excited we had the space to do it the first time and that it's going to continue as it should continue forever and ever. And um, very happy to be here. Great, thank you, Lulu. Um, and Lulu is in Florida, Orlando, Florida. And so oh, I just yeah. kind of wanted to pinpoint everyone. Orlando, Florida is Lulu. Um, we have Veronica and Matt in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I'm just on the outskirts of, of Salt Lake. Um, yeah, thank you, Lulu. Thank you everyone for your introductions. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Roger Sang. I own an operator creative studio here um, called Salt City Garage. I also own and operate a inflatable paddle boarding company called Stoked Paddle Company. And I have two podcasts. One's a comedy podcast called Dudes from Utah. And the other one is called Crossing Paths with Roger Sang. Um, but I haven't really recorded any new episodes since the beginning of the pandemic. So here we are at a podcast event. Um, however, last we left off, we were talking about the importance of representation in media, in, in the media, in the news, in movies, in, in the newspaper, things like that. The importance of seeing somebody that looks like you. And that's where we left off. But I wanted to keep that discussion going with us. And it's interesting because we did an outlier panel back in January at, in Salt Lake about diversity. We then came together a couple of weeks ago to talk about diversity again and how much that topic has changed and evolved so much. And even from then to now, two weeks later, diversity is starting to become even a bigger topic of conversation for us. So I kind of open up to our panelists and, and just chime in when you would like to, but I'm curious, let's just, let's just start on racism. You know, I'm gonna go right deep to the heart um, because we're gonna talk about diversity in here as well. Um, my question for all of you, does racism even exist where you live? Man, we're coming right out of the gate swinging, Roger. Is anybody <laughs> gonna say no? Cause I'm fascinated and I would like we, to move there. I had no time last time. So let's just go straight to it. You no, know, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because um, Utah is uh, known to be quite a homogenous state in terms of race, right? And so it's hard to say that it, uh, at least from the outside, that it that it doesn't exist because you, you, it's ever so homogenous. It's so Caucasian almost everywhere you go, and it's also a uh, very. Uh, I guess not that diverse outside of race. I mean, it's a very religious state as well. There's a lot of uh, commonalities with religion, with race, and with uh, just modes of thinking. And so, it's kind of has it has that stigma, the state of Utah. But I think on the flip side, uh, because of the lack of diversity, that that uh, and you've seen this with with problems with the Utah Jazz at games, the jazz games, and and using certain slurs that. Uh, sometimes might be out of ignorance. So it exists, it definitely exists because I think there's a lack of education where I'm from and, and a lack of actual diversity, really. Uh, and so you see, you hear different slurs. If you're from out of state, you're kind of an implant to Utah and you hear those things, you're like, uh, you just need to be educated, right? And we need to, we need to fix that uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. No, that was great. That was great, man. I was, I was going to let anybody else speak. I, Lulu, I, you have a different, you live in a different place than we do. So I do. I do. Talk, and, and before the us. pandemic, I lived in New York. Uh, so it, 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 it is very different. It's extremely diverse in New York, um, which does not give it a pass on, on not having racism. Because I think that there, there are two questions here, which is, is your area blatantly racist <laughs> or does your area have racial undertones? You know, because I think that that, I mean, that's a huge, let's dig deep. Uh, there's a lot of systemic racism that we grew up with that we don't even know is affecting our standards of beauty or, or who we're, or who we consider dating or who we give money to or who we open our house to. Like there, there's just things that we don't know because life is life. So so growing up is a, is a process of deprogramming that, which actually goes back a lot to the media, which is what uh, we were kind of jump-starting off of. Um, I, think, I think racism is not a thing that you check a box and it's gone. I think it is a constant, um, a constant thing you have to think about. Not necessarily, oh, today I'm gonna wake up and make sure I'm not a racist, but every, you know, just, just checking yourself once in a while and going, did I profile that person? Did I, did I make an assumption about someone and where did that come from? You know, is it from something that's factual right now or am I piecing together 
assumptions that I've carried with me a long time and now applying it to what's happening. Um, so it's a loaded question. I, I honestly think there's not a place where you can say there is no racism here. There are communities that you can say we work very hard on it and we love each other and we are all equal in each other's eyes and that's great. But then when you turn on the TV, who do you see on TV? Um, and what kind of media are you incorporating in your life? And what kind of media do you pass by on Netflix and go, that's not a story that would appeal to me? Is it because of what the stars look like? Is it because it's set somewhere that you've never been or you don't have you know, a, a association with? So racism, is, it's, it's, it's hard to say, is it, is it never here? I think it lives with us and we're constantly just trying to um, both celebrate the differences that we have and also not let it affect our idea of each other's worth. And that's a, that's a lifelong thing. That's not a, we finished, <laughs> we're done, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? That representation is extremely important, right? I remember, um, you know, I'm, I've been in film for a long time in, in media, mostly on the business side. But so that's even worse, right? Cause you're actually mm -hmm. picking uh, what that representation might look like. Uh, and I became kind of, a, well, not friends because we, I've never met him in person, but the now CMO of NPR, Michael Smith, I met him on LinkedIn, an African-American man, incredibly intelligent and the right pick for, for NPR. And I remember speaking, meeting with him uh, before he became CMO uh, at, at NPR. He was kind of consulting and mentoring me a few years ago. I met him on LinkedIn and he was super uh, quick to jump in and, and give me advice and I remember him saying something along the lines of, you know, our country is so much more diverse now, but when you go to the, when you go to the screen, you still see America from the 50s and 60s. It's, it's really odd. And from, to see, well, it's really disheartening, really. I, I believe, or what, I don't think that were, those were his exact words, but it, if that's what it felt like, if I'm remembering this correctly, this conversation we had. And when, you, when, when Black Panther came out, it was, you see, little black kids running around saying, yes, I can look up to a superhero now that looks like me. That's extremely powerful. And it's starting to slowly change. And you can see that representation happening. Same with politics, right? Politics is, it's a duopoly uh, right now, but and it's, it's largely representative of a generational paradigm. And you don't see the representation of the real America or modern America. And, and Again, to Michael's point uh, earlier, it was it's disheartening, and so it's it's we need to take those initiatives ourselves. And I'll I'll give people the benefit of the doubt. I don't I don't think, and I, I'm trying to be as optimistic as I can here, but I don't believe we're blatantly racist. Now there are definitely blatant racists out there. I don't want to argue that, but I think the common person, at least the common Caucasian white person, uh, is not blatantly racist but because of the what how we how we were raised and what we saw a lack of representation i think there is some subconscious uh like you say systemic racism yeah. i i talk um because i'm an actor i talk about casting a lot and we talk about this default idea and especially in the way you describe people so if I described someone, you said a man walked into the grocery store, what did he look like? And I said, oh, well, he had brown hair and he was six, five and he was lanky and he was saying, you're building an idea. And if they're not white, we usually start with their race, right? But if they're white, we don't say the race. So we have this idea of a default that is not healthy for any of us. It's not healthy for, for Caucasian Americans. It's not healthy for anyone because you, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't quite work out with the way we should distribute power in the country and wealth and all that kind of things. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's a really, really big deal. If you grow up watching people, I'm gonna go to romantic comedies, uh, people fall in love with a certain type of person all the time. A little girl is gonna grow up thinking no one's gonna fall in love with her. I know that seems extreme, but that's what happens. Um, if you see a good guy in a movie always saving the day and a certain other type of person always being, I don't know, a terrorist, then that young kid is never going to see himself on the other side of it. And it's, it's, it's a problem in media. It, it's something that, yes, we can attack it on the, on the industry side. And it's also something that as consumers, we can search out different media to expand our, our um, knowledge base too.
Right. Yeah, and I think uh, when it comes to racism, uh, actions speak louder than words. You can say that you're not racist until your heart's content, but if your brand, if your business, if your personal brand talks about or centers on just one race as and it's not all inclusive if i go to somebody's instagram if i go to somebody's facebook and all i see is white people there is a problem with that there's a problem with the messages that we that we are sending i went to the university of utah of utah law school and there there's all this unspoken rules when you're applying for jobs here in Salt Lake City to the main law firms. And you the people don't say it, but there are law firms here in, in Salt Lake City that don't hire women and then don't hire people of color. And that was back in 2016 when I graduated. Now it's changing a little bit. And now you see one or two people of color because they were forced to open their doors to people that were not white males. So, and but they, those law firms would be the same law firms that would contribute with money to organizations and events that we, we, we that minorities will be part of it in law school, like uh, women's my, um, youth and minority bar association and uh, women of color, they would be constantly uh, sending money and being part of that. But then when it was time for them to hire, they wouldn't hire women or they, were, they wouldn't hire people of color. So what is your organization, your brand, your business saying about being inclusive, saying about racism and the way that you're incorporating people of all races in your personal brand and your business? Right. One, one point on that, Roger, real quick. I mean, uh, building a startup myself, right? And, and, and since I'm not able to travel anymore because of the pandemic, I'm stuck in this apocryphal homogenous state, right? Where there are a lot of white males. And so I look at my co-founding team. I'm a big believer in diversity. I'm a big believer, believer in diversity of thought. It brings new perspective, especially for startups looking to solve a really big problem in the industry that we're in and, and that's what we require however um, it's it's you need to also look at what your surroundings bring you right and so i when i look at the talent pool around me uh it's slim pickings right i mean it's it's a lot of trout if you if, if you catch my drift and, 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 and not a lot of salmon and so I, I have to eat trout all day. I mean, that's a really bad metaphor, but that's, that's what I get, you know? So I, you kind of have to think about your surroundings. And, and when you take yourself out of that, though, and put yourself somewhere else, what is more diverse, that's where you need the education on equity and equality. And uh, it, but, but I think we just need to be cognizant of where we are. I, am I wrong in thinking that? I, I don't know. But uh, I just intuitively... I need to look at my team and say, okay, well, we're all Caucasian, we're all male. I would love to have a diversity of, of perspective here, but honestly, I, I don't have a lot to choose from. Right. Well, it's different when you have a job opening and only white people, white male are applying for it. Right. But when you have women, when you have people of color applying, and then there's just this pattern of rejection and pattern mm -hmm. of not opening to and not even hiring like what about certain events that you can have in your organization that you can bring those people together into your community so the thing that i have trouble with is that maybe you just don't feel like you're wanted in a certain place maybe you feel different like i being in situations where i just don't feel welcome i don't feel if i step into an organization or a business and they're all white male and i mean it's, it it's just not i mean it's a daunting it's intimidating and you don't feel welcome and if it's just a male dominated industry then i can understand that a little bit but it's just i feel like we have a disadvantage a little bit in that regard and maybe it's just be me bitter against law school because I had a horrible time. <laughs> I had, so my class were a hundred students and 
we were only five women of color and all five of us ended up going to public service because even though we had the grades and we had we were hard workers and we just didn't get the chance to be in a big firm so maybe it's just that i'm a little bitter against that but we'll be bitter veronica we're here for you we got yeah, you i know yeah. <laughs> just really, let it go no this is that's really why valuable. i don't practice anymore this is really valuable that's a very valuable perspective um lula go ahead well um i i hear what matt's saying because we run into this a lot in casting in in projects and stuff because you'll have a project in your head you say i want to have a diverse cast and then you just don't have those people walk in the room and in theater at least the which is which tends to be a really progressive industry in a lot of ways so it it kind of uh, spearheads a lot of these initiatives we just uh, a lot of the projects that i'm on decided that fine we'll, we'll figure out the casting of this present project but now we have to invest in creating generations who will then walk in the room in 20 years because like when veronica says i just didn't feel welcome i get that there are lots of gigs that I would never have auditioned for, jobs that I never would have um, looked at because I said in my head, they probably won't hire me. And I took it off my plate. Yes, sure, I should have, I should have auditioned for it. I should have put my name out there, absolutely. It costs money sometimes to apply for these jobs, to get there, to do all these things. And when you're talking about minorities, often, not all the time, you're talking about people at a lower income level or, or that have not mm -hmm. as much of a cushion maybe that they came right. up with from their parents or something. So job applications and the, and the access to job applications is not as clear sometimes for people whose parents aren't already in that white collar world. Um, so spoon feeding it a little bit to your comfort level, I think can really help. Um, and just knowing that it's a long game, but I also understand Matt, yeah, you're dealing with who walks in the door. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, your five-year plan can be, how do we put another door in the building? Mm -hmm. right. Or it can be like, you know, like how can I collaborate with other people? How can I bring that diversity? It doesn't necessarily mean through hiring, but through collaborating with other people in your industry that doesn't look like you. <laughs> well, there's, there, there's a popular psychological uh, study you know with Carl Jung a, a popular psychologist and, and philosopher he he has the 12 Jungian archetypes and it's basically classifying society into 12 different archetypes and it got, I'll just go back to the, the the world that I live in now as an, as an entrepreneur when I go build a team I need to find a co-founder who is a similar archetype to me right mm -hmm. but that that can also be very misconstrued with race so going back to mm -hmm. Roger's original point on racism, oh, uh, it, it's an educational thing, right? So when I go look for that same or similar archetype, how I'm perceived, I need to find somebody that thinks like me so we can, we can push this vision forward. As we grow the team, that's when you get diverse because you look at different angles and bring in different perspectives to solve a problem. But the, the first co-founder or two should be a very similar archetype to you. But where we go wrong with that is, well, same as me, it doesn't always mean race. It shouldn't look at the skin color as, as same. It should be the way that, that we think, uh, the same ideologies, and uh, do, we, do we share similar chemistry, internal and, and not external? Yeah, that's right. awesome. Absolutely, yeah. I think, that, I think that what you've all touched on were actually very important points of the topic. And, you know, we did talk about racism, but there is a huge... There's, there's a fine line between racism because racism is hate. So there's a fine line between racism and discrimination. And the thing is, I, I don't know if everyone has seen the, you know, the amazing film, Crazy Rich Asians, big deal for the Asian community. But if you've ever seen that movie, that movie is spot on resemblance of how Asian families are. I grew up in an Asian family. Fair to say, we were racist like easy yeah. and so when we talk about racism it isn't just about you know white people are racist yeah, against no. color people it's we are we are all we all grew up in it somewhere in our genealogical line and and somewhere in some families it sticks around a lot longer than it needs to be mm -hmm. but you know matt you you spoke a lot about you didn't say the words but you spoke a lot about diverse thinking 
And so that's kind of what, what I value about each of you on the panel is that everybody here has diverse thinking. And that's what I'm hoping that we can get the message out there more is to understand each other's perspectives. Veronica, you and I are both brown in Utah, mm -hmm. but I'm not a woman. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, you're experiencing a totally different thing. And Matt, you're discriminated against every day by someone that's brown, guaranteed. So, <laughs> so there's that. And, and so judge. Yeah, we do, probably, we judge. We and so, yeah. so the thing is, it's important to have diverse thought. And, and I think that does drive a lot of value to, to the mission that we're all trying to, to push out there. So mm -hmm. thinking about, it's, it's, sorry, oh, go sorry. ahead, Veronica. It's just about, sorry, I interrupted you. You were like, no, you're good. getting somewhere, but uh, <laughs> like you said, like my mom is big time racist against white people. In fact, she didn't want me to marry a white guy. Same. So yeah. So, <laughs> so ra racism can, is not only uh, white people discriminated against uh, other races that it can happen in any of the races is is just that we need to stop and think about our businesses and our daily actions and how we're making sure that we're including everybody into the mix so for example in our case we tend to attract more people who look like me uh, brown it's um, women and minorities. And so we're trying to change that a little bit so white male can come to us too. And now in our courses, we have a 50-50, 50-50 um, uh, um, people of color and white people. And that, so that's something that we had to sit down and discuss because Steven, he's my partner and he's white. And I'm brown, but for some reason, people resonate more with me. And I was attracting more people of my race than his race, which was very interesting. So it's it's a matter of just thinking how you can attract a more diverse pool of people into your organization or into your brand. Contrarian. Let me be a little contrarian to that, if you will. I think that it, mostly because it's good TV, right? We have to have some sort of opposing opinion. Yes, that, yes, yes. <laughs> even though I, I'll, I'll agree with you, but I, I, I'm, I'm looking at digging a little deeper and being, being a white male, middle-aged, you know, it's, um, as you said, Roger, I, a lot of people are looking at me thinking I can't, no one can be racist towards me. I mean, that, that's completely false. We can't redefine the word racism. Um, but to your point, Veronica, it's, that's kind of societal though, right? That we gravitate towards our tribe, right? That's mm -hmm. just in our DNA as, as human beings, as animals. And that instinct is to go gravitate to people like me. Right. That's not like I, I'm not conscientiously necessarily going, I need to go with that guy because he looks like me. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to how do, how do you break that cycle? And that's it's a psychological thing. It's just, I think it's uh, to use a baseball metaphor at bats. I need more at bats. I need more chances to swing the ball or swing the bat at a ball. And until I start connecting and getting base hits, I, it's just it's it's, it's exposure. And uh, it's, it's along the ladder of inference psychologically, we have to rewire and re hardwire our brains to think differently, but that's going to take time, patience and less toxicity. And we have to stop leading in these conversations with toxicity and vitriol. It's, it's so frustrating. You know, I, I'd rather be a little bit cynical than, I, than toxic. You know, I, I think it's a better way to. Um, I, I, I think that what you just said about Matt, about people gravitating towards people that look at them and, and it being kind of a part of us, I think it is a part of our indoctrination because I'm a huge sci-fi fan. And um, one of the big things in sci-fi, if, if you look at like future worlds, is that Earth versus other planets is, not, is usually not different races of Earth versus different races like the the general view is that by then we will have become like earth citizens and not other things um which attracts me I like I like that idea so I think for me yes I do think that we gravitate towards people that we think we have things in common with I'm trying to challenge myself to expand that idea 
So people that I, so, in, you know, it, yes, people that look like me, I have things in common with. Also people that do this with me and then people that do this with me and then people do this with me. That, that's not a very specific example, but you know what I mean. Well, and- it be very uh, George Peterson-esque. It's, it's like, okay, we, I don't mean to be super conservative as a contrarian here, but I, I, I do think because we are in our societal cliques around the, around the world, I mean, you have in Southeast Asia, you have Singapore and Indonesia and Malaysia, you have people that are, are like you, right? Mm -hmm. Same with Europe, you have Caucasians in Europe and, and, and you have black people in Africa, most parts of Africa, but in the United States, that's what makes us different. So I wouldn't necessarily say at the core of our DNA, that's indoctrination. I think that's just really instinct. Now that doesn't mean that we we go against each other. We do, we can't like each other. We can't get along because we are homo sapiens after all, right? But uh, that's the beauty of America as a melting pot that brought so many cultures together. And, and But I think the, the dark side to your point though about indoctrination, yeah. I think that's what happened in the United States uh, it, 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 amongst other things, but to a very small degree. But really, if you break it down to DNA, I really believe we break into tribes, but how do you, how do you psychologically overcome yeah. that? That's I, I don't No, it's okay. I don't think I buy into the tribe thing, which is not to say, I mean, I have no facts. You know what I mean? We're all just debating what we feel in our gut. So it could be true. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but my example would be, so I lived, I, I lived in Europe for a couple of years. And whenever I saw another American, I would get really excited. Right. And you're talking Ooh. about your background and the thing. And that person regardless of what color they were, I had more in common with than someone that looked like me that lived in France, if that makes sense. Totally. So that's why I'm saying like, I do agree with you that we tend to um, gravitate towards people that are similar to us. I just don't always think, I don't necessarily think that biologically it has to be on racial lines. Well, think about though, as an American in Europe, when you find another American, that's still your tribe. You get a little excited about it. Yeah, right? yeah, that's yeah, really yeah. That's what I'm, yeah. So I'm just saying like, the idea of tribe doesn't have to sit with race and we can expand that. And I think exactly. you see that's my point that. too. I, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely. There. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know we're like basically on the same side. <laughs> I just don't, <laughs> I just didn't really buy into the tribe thing, but I think, totally <laughs> I think my thing with Matt is Matt is so intellectual and he, he has a very large vernacular that I could just listen to him speak all day long. Cause I'm like, I don't know. You, you, you just speak very eloquently. Okay. Um, but I want to kind of shift gears for a second there. Um, we talked about, you know, Veronica, you talked about not being able to get opportunities because of your nationality, because of you're a woman, things like that. Or at least that's what you felt coming off of that, those situations. Um, Lulu, you talked about acting. I, I always wondered this. If, if I was an actor, which would be super awesome, you know, preferably uh -huh. a superhero if I could, um, yes. would I want to, and I got to be an Asian superhero, would I want my role to be wit written by someone that was not Asian. Does you being a superhero that's Asian have a lot of stuff to do with being Asian? Are you like Mr. Asian Man? Or are you Spider-Man who happens to be Asian? Shang-Chi, let's say Shang-Chi, that role's already taken. But if, if I was gonna be up for a role that is centered around Asian and martial arts, I, I've asked myself, would I be more comfortable if an Asian screenwriter wrote that role? or of some of someone of another nationality. And that's the thing is, I think that we want to see representation in everybody on screen or in the media, but there's a whole team behind making that happen. So I always think that we need, you know, Roger, we want to see more Asian actors out there. Well, we need more Asian directors. We need more Asian writers. We need more Asian producers. And the cool thing about this group in particular is I know everybody here is an entrepreneur and I think you're all blazing the trails for yourself and your, the generations that'll connect to you because there's not many people that look like you, even you, Matt, you look different from us as well. Um, <laughs> and even ever, um, there's not many people that are blazing the trail that look like you. But once you start to do that, others will follow and then we will have that more diverse world that you're talking about, Matt, the, the, the more representation we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that goes into, a, a, that's a really cool segue. I mean, we'll tie it all back together, I'm sure, but an interesting segue into um, gender in the work in the workplace, because you see, uh, well, and this is the pay gap problem, right? Definitely, women definitely deserve to be paid equally to men. Absolutely. Uh, however, here's, here's the contrarian in me, and I want to analyze this, and it's just, it's just part of who I am. Maybe it's a fault that I have, but 
men gravitate towards more engineering like jobs what's in demand engineering style jobs or stem jobs they pay more and you just don't see enough women in those fields uh, and i'll come back to that in a second but you see women tend to go more towards humanities degrees right and they they don't tend to pay nearly as much which is incredibly unfortunate but you don't see uh, a pay e equality there because the, the, the fields are just so different and that's just the free market, right? What's so the I think it goes to a younger, it goes younger, right? I think it starts younger and that we yeah. need to be influencing our young girls just like we are our young boys to get into coding. It's, I only have, I only have boys, so I can't speak to girls. I have three boys, so I have no idea what it's like to, to raise a, a girl. So you guys can help me out there, but I am fully aware that if I ever had a daughter, I would want her to learn to code like my oldest son. And I'd like my, my other son to be fully aware of how to care for people, right? And to be charitable. I, men and different, men and women have different vibes, different energies. Absolutely. We are different people. Uh, we have to acknowledge that. But at the same time, we also have to acknowledge that uh, we gravitate towards different things. And do we blame capitalism? You know? Food for thought. I just think it's it's different uh, when it comes to pay disparity between men and women. We just want to be considered and be paid the same. If I decide to be an engineer, and if I the same, I have have if I have the same credentials and the same education as a white male, I just want to be considered and to be paid the same. Absolutely. Uh, if I want to go into other field, if I want to be a social worker, I understand that maybe those kind of jobs are not paid the same as an engineer, but I want to be paid the same as a social, as a white male social worker in my field. So when you see that is like, when you see the disparity and it's like, why, why is that happening? Why I am I not getting paid if I have the same credentials, if I have the same education? And sometimes my credentials are even better. I have a better training and better education. And still, I'm not getting paid the same. Right, right. And, and I'm, I'm, my argument is only I think we're taking the, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's a standard statistical rule, right? And so I think the statistics are skewed. And I don't think we're looking at the right data. And I don't think I we're looking at the right analysis. And so I, I completely agree, Veronica. There, you have the same qualifications I do. In fact, you're you're much more talented than I am. So you should get paid more than oh, me. Oh, right? you're sweet. Right. And, and and so I didn't go to law school. I did the the, the lame business route, which is kind of saturated, you know. But uh, if we have the same credentials, gosh, what beat me on merit and get paid mm -hmm. the same? Absolutely. And. and we could go down this rabbit hole for you know forever right yeah but you know like you, that is something that you have in you you right. have that mentality and you have that open mindedness and you have that when you're hiring you have that you take that into account it's like i'm not going to look at gender i'm just going to look at credentials but not everybody do does what you do not everybody takes those, those things into consideration and there's discrimination happening so you are you are the exception. Yes. You are an exception, Matt. You're an exception. Yes, that's, that's an exceptional. Um, I are. also think that women have softer, um, in general, have softer negotiating skills. Oh yes, definitely. Uh, women have more passive voices in emails, <laughs> mm -hmm. in conversations, mm -hmm. in all that kind of stuff. We, I, I, I feel it in myself. We tend to apologize for ourselves a lot. Mm -hmm. We tend to own up to mistakes faster, um, and that that also leads into um, pay, merit pay, bonuses. And that's where a lot of that disparity can happen on the same level as well. Mm -hmm. So again, that's, I mean, I know it's gonna be the word of the day, but that's something systemic, right? That, that mm -hmm. we have to, so for me, my emails, I have a male friend that I pass almost all my important business emails through and he goes, take that out, stop apologizing. All you have to do is ask for it. Mm -hmm. How do you solve it? How do you solve yeah. that? Right, um, I mean, talk about the, the, the topics all day, but. I mean, what's the actual solution or what's the first step to, towards solving that, that mm -hmm. issue? Right? I mean, we have to acknowledge mm -hmm. that you're different in, in the way you think than I am. And, and I'm, I tend to be more type A. I can be stubborn. I can be stubborn as hell. I tell you. And, and asking my wife, the poor thing, she's like, 
but that's the, that's why we work so well together because she's non-confrontational. I'm aggressive. I'm competitive. I'm going to go after it. But that's we have to recognize that that back and forth that instead of competing against what you just said, Lulu, it's, it's rather let's collaborate together. I think mm -hmm. that's the first step to solving this issue is recognizing that we are different and that we solve problems differently and they both have their own value. I, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I do think, I don't know how to phrase this. You know, they used to do these, um, they did a study at Harvard once where they asked men, uh, freshmen, I think, freshmen students, male and female, uh, to make a list of their faults and then a list of their, um, their, their pros. And by far, the male students had much longer pro lists than the women and the women focused on the cons. I personally do not think that I am biologically engineered to think of myself worse than a male person of my everything same, right? Like same age, same, same socioeconomic, everything. I just don't think that. I do think that I have uh, I have systemic bias towards my own worth because of the way that our society is. Um, I, I can't buy in to women just tend to be softer because they are softer. I think women tend to be softer because, because we're told when we're kids, like, hey, 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 don't be too loud. Don't be mm -hmm. too loud. Make sure, make sure you ask, you know, make sure you ask nicely. Don't, don't, don't ever, don't ever ask, make sure you apologize. Mm -hmm. And we are just taught to communicate in a softer way. Lula, if you knew my mom, you would be backtracking right now. <laughs> that woman can, she can run a small <laughs> European country in her sleep. Oh, I, I believe it. That's, I, I believe I, it. But then, but then look, and I'm not, I, I'm not, don't worry ever. I'm not going into politics, but I will say <laughs> that, that, strong women are seen as brassy and bossy and loud and you hear people say oh I just don't like her voice who says that about a male mm -hmm. a male anything no one ever says I don't like his voice mm -hmm. you don't hear it in podcasting people will stop listening to a, a, a lot I just don't like women because I don't like their voices I don't like the vocal fry at the end I don't like it when they do up speak I don't like it when that's a regional mm -hmm. difference that's a generational difference you got to get over it listen to the words yeah. Yeah, People and that's why not talk about men that way. You need to spend more that's time. That's why with I think, around, don't they? That's the whole point. Spend more time with Brene, and you'll change your way. Your yes, outlook. absolutely. Everyone should. Everyone should be with Brene. <laughs> that's Brown, why. Always. That's why I think it's so important. Like Roger said, that we are being example. We're being tra trailblazers for other people who are watching us, other people who are looking up to us, and be like if we can do it if we can speak up if we can take our place if we can stop negotiating ask for what we want then other women will take up on that example so that's why sometimes I, I don't recognize my own worth I'm very bad at negotiating with clients sometimes I get taken advantage of but then at those moments when I am deciding my worth I just think about the people in my community who are watching me. Because if, if it was just me, then I was just gonna, because I was raised that way. Like, don't speak up, you, you don't, and in the Latin community, it's even worse because it's male dominated and you basically, you don't have a voice. Um, so I struggle with that. But then I think about the people in my community, the women in my community who are watching me, the, the messages that I'm sending, then, Oh, then I, I'm just going to give all the praise and all the, the recognition to Stephen because he's the one doing things. No, I'm doing things too. Yeah. I am running the show. I'm running the business. I am responsible for the, our social media, our running and all these things. So I'm constantly reminding myself, you're not doing this just for you. You're doing this for people, women who are watching you and also men who are watching me because then they're going to be, they're going to learn that not to mess with me. <laughs> That's, this is, this is fascinating because, well, thank you for sharing your perspectives on this. This is very fascinating. Um, I, I did bad juju this week on Facebook. I posted something about politics, which oh, I learned no. I don't ever want to do again, but I've been so tempted. <laughs> very tempted. And 
I, I posted about condemning racism or condemning white supremacy. We don't need to get into that. I don't want, I don't want this to turn into an argument or discussion about that. However, I, I felt like my voice wasn't being understood. I felt like my voice was heard, but not understood. And it wasn't until I did a second follow-up post about racist experiences that I've had in my life. I, I've, I laid out all the names I was called. I talked about one time when mm -hmm. I was driving, when I was a teenager, I was driving home and a truck full of white males with skin, with, with shaved heads were yelling at me, flipping me off. And I was terrified. And, and as a father, now it terrifies me that that may happen to my kids in this world. And yes, it does happen here in Utah, things like that. And mm -hmm. I feel like people didn't get the point until I had to illustrate that. And just like you ladies just said here, were, were some of the examples that you've had, a light bulb went off and on it for me. Like I, I knew everything that we were already talking about, but it really like helped me understand when you painted that picture for me. So I, I, I don't know, I just, I just wanted to share that with you because I thought that that was really important. Um, so we talked about racism. We talked about representation. We've also talked about gender inequality, which is real. I, I think our generation is so unique. That, that's probably the problem with this group as well is that we're all around the same age range. So we're not really that diverse in age either because I think in all of our minds, in our world, we, we were kind of like flabbergasted. Why is there a gender gap, gender pay gap? Like, why does that even exist? Um, but I also want to talk about, I, I, know, I know we have a few minutes left here on the clock. And I wanted to, to kind of talk about, you know, you all have very diverse platforms. It's 2020, COVID, it, we've all been at home. Everyone and their dog is starting a podcast right now. This is like the year to start a podcast apparently. And it's everywhere. So I'm just curious. And you know, I don't wanna hear a political answer of like, yeah, I'm producing a podcast because I want it to be diverse. But I'm curious to know as outside of the topic of diversity, we know that's kind of the undertone here is what impact do each of you hope to have through your platforms? Ooh, um, that's 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 heavy <laughs> no we got time there's Take a, it away matt there's the I, I look at it like a proverbial pendulum swinging from side to side right and and metaphorically speaking or hypothetically you've got this pendulum that swings this way maybe for for 10 years it's over here but then it gets so uh ugly that it needs to come back this side because this side's clamoring for attention now and then and then maybe you know, it's, it's like right now uh, who's failing in schools not girls who's going to college not boys right who's dying in war who's who's going to jail who's who's more homeless these are all men right um women are in college more but they still get better opportunities with scholarships right and, and i'm not trying to bring up a, 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 a debate on that thing i'm just basically showing that you know, 10, 15 years ago, the pendulum was on the side of the men. Now it's on the side of the women. My point that I'm trying to get across is I, it takes an immovable force, an immovable force to stop the energy of that pendulum swinging back and forth. It needs to find equilibrium. And so I, my hope and my aim with my podcast and, and with my co-host is to really, uh, yes, we want to break the stigma of mental health amongst the founding community, but there's also... Uh, a point in time where we need to actually stop the swinging of that pendulum and 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 really focus on the equilibrium if, at least find equilibrium I, I hope that made sense i hope it wasn't too abstract but anyway who's next <laughs> i can go i can go that was good. Take, take how the, do you follow up the... with that <laughs> no, take, a, take a break was... <laughs> time, time out yeah commercial yeah, time out. hold on <laughs> I need um, a drink too. This this yeah. this episode was brought to you by Outlier nope. HQ. Drink. That's a post-it. That's a post on a can. That's a post on a can. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, I have a comment. Another, podcast. Well, one one last point, Lulu. Sorry. Yeah. To no, the last fine. existential question I'm going to put out there is: Is there an immovable force to stop the, that momentum swinging in the pendulum? And if so, what would it be? I, I think it's. I think it's. I think it's the generation that's about 18 to 25 right now. I don't have faith in those in Gen Z. I don't trust them. <laughs> Can I pose a question, I, I, actually? Let me, let me pose a question. So I think that, you know, myself, ever, even, and Veronica and Lulu, I think mentally, some, whether it be a large degree or a small degree, 
we play victim in our minds because of the way we look, because of our backgrounds. Do you play, I'm, I'm curious, does white male play victim in their mind as well? Uh, no, we play imposter syndrome. It's different. Right? That totally makes sense to me. Interesting. I, yeah. When I go overseas, I, I travel a lot. I lived in South America. I've lived in Europe. I've lived everywhere uh, for a long extended period of time. And I am the worst, the absolute worst at just picking up on accents. I cannot fit into society. I stand out like a sore thumb. I mean, I love culture and I, I, I absorb it the best I can, but I can't, I can't mimic a, a Latino's accent. Veronica, I just can't do that. No way. I can't mock a, a, or, or mimic a, a British accent either. And I've spent a lot of time in the UK. So what I'm saying is I'm a novelty item when I go to those places. And so they like to ask me the same old questions. Oh, where in America are you from? Oh, I'm from Utah. Well, how many guns, cow, uh, cows and wives do you have? And I always say two, four, two, right? Just to get a laugh. But I, they know exactly where I'm from. They know I'm American right away and they treat you like it. Oh, I have a cousin in North Carolina. Well, this is a big country. I don't know North Carolina. I don't know your cousin. So anyway, we have imposter syndrome. And I think there's a novelty item aspect that uh, we can all experience wherever we are if we're outside our own little comfort zone. So, but yeah, no, we, if we play victim, uh, it's because of it's a, it's a sexist thing, not a racist thing. Um, I, but, but generally, I think white men have imposter syndrome, that we can't live up to what uh, we are, our potential. That's fascinating. Uh, really, thank you. I, I hope you know that this is valuable information for me to take from your perspective as for well. For all of us. So, yeah, that's, that's really amazing. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Lulu and Veronica, impact of your oh. shows. What, what do you, what, what you want to have? Uh, well, I have a comedy podcast. So the, the surface impact is I want 10 minutes of your day to be lighter than the rest of your 10 minutes of the day. Uh, I want you to either start it off great or end it great and feel like you have a community and feel like people get you and you're not crazy. And that's, that's what I want out of that in general. Uh, the subversive side of that <laughs> is that we really want everyone to realize that there are commonalities. So that's going, that kind of really uh, runs into to the conversation I had with Matt about tribes. Um, we want the idea of tribes to expand. That, that is something that we believe in. We believe in that a lot. One of our segments or one of our episodes is an interview episode. We deliberately look for people of all ages, genders, um, backgrounds, socioeconomic, everything we can find, hopefully as much as we can. We ask, we do a little lead in and then we ask them the same five questions. And we do that on purpose because they're questions that, that are bouncing off points, but they also show that everyone has dreams and everyone, one of the questions is what would you do with $10,000? And then the other one is, you know, what would you do to give away $10,000? So it, it's a really great way to show that everyone looks up, everyone reaches down, everyone, you know, finds something that's happy. And, and during the quarantine, especially when we asked our last question, which is what's something, I know this might sound so Pollyanna, but what makes you happy right now? Almost every single person said, I'm home with my family. I get to be home with my family. And I think hearing that from someone who doesn't look like you, who doesn't sound like you, who has an accent that's not like yours, who, who just told you a story about some culture that they live in that's not yours, and then their happy is the same thing as your happy. I don't know anything that can break that pendulum more than that. So that's what we try to do. So in our, uh, in our case, we, on the surface, we teach people how to podcast. Our podcast is about podcasting and our YouTube channel is about teaching people the tools and the skills that they need to start their own podcast. If you go deeper, which I've had the opportunity to do it now that I have students and clients is like we are providing the tools in this space for them to express themselves to tell their stories and also to connect with their communities or to build their own communities. And I think um, the majority of our students, you can see their faces like lighting up when they hear their voices for the first time, when they have this idea and they know that they're building a community around their podcast, when they know that they are sharing their, their stories of 
of suffering or, or their stories of struggle. And there's are people on the other end listening and getting inspired. And then you see, and then you revisit those people six months or a year after they've been podcasting and it's the best thing like that they could have ever done. And it's the, it has been the best thing for me too, because so here, here I was in, in an industry that I felt uncomfortable. I didn't feel appreciated. I didn't feel like my talents and the things that I was bringing to the table were appreciated. And then I got into podcasting and all of a sudden there are people who want to listen to me. There are people who, who is looking at me as an example and I feel embraced and I feel, and just be here and having this conversation with Matt and Lulu and Roger is, is just so surreal for me. I couldn't never get not even my boss's attention for two seconds. <laughs> so, so it's like, it's so, so great what podcasting is doing for people and what podcasting is doing for me which is just a way for us to connect with other people, to feel embraced, to find our own communities and to find the people who identified with our ideals, with our purpose, and just have that feeling of belonging and not, not have it to be such an uphill battle and such a, such a, something that you have to force and every day you just have this feeling of not belonging. So that's, that's what we do. I was this getting emotional. No, bit. this is great. This so is good. really good. Um, so I know Lulu and Veronica because we actually met at Outlier in Salt Lake back in January. Um, Matt and I knew each other from mutual friends. But so Matt, I hope that you get the opportunity to come to one of these Outlier events one of these days because it is, it's, I, I, I told Ever before we started this tonight was that Outlier in January, all the way back in January was one of, the highlights of my year and I mean it because there's some power surrounding this experience of when you're surrounded by fellow podcasters we're all doing something of our own in the same realm and there's some energy in that mm -hmm. um I don't know actually let me grab this putting a plug in because I'm currently reading creativity inc right now um, yes, ever that is this is amazing I so that. I get I, Hit the link below. I get a kickback. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but Creativity Inc. is quite amazing. For those of you that don't know, Steve Jobs, when he was fired from Apple, he started Next Computer and he bought Pixar. He became one of the founders of Pixar as, as uh, George Lucas was selling Pixar. And it's interesting because they formed this group called the Brain Trust. And the Brain Trust was this group of leaders or thought leaders in the company that would help define the next moves for the company. What's interesting is you th think of Steve Jobs. I, I love Steve Jobs for what he did. I, I think that he's just a fascinating person. And what's interesting is he went to most of these brain trust meetings, not saying anything because he knew that he wasn't an expert in some of these things that they were talking about, but he had the right people hired to make those decisions. The reason why I bring that up here is because I think with uh, podcasting, it's, it's very cliche. Podcasting is a voice. Everyone here, the, it's 2020, everybody's having a podcast. And it's because we're all, we all have a platform to share our voice. This hasn't happened in, in past histories, 10, 20 years ago. This technology that we have didn't exist. The internet wasn't as big as it is now. And so I think it's very important for all of us and everybody to have their own voice, and their own platform to share it on. And to know when to say something, but as I mentioned in Creativity Inc., was know when not to say something as well. So I'm not saying hold yourself back, but just uh, gauge your audience, engage the topics that we talk about, because if we are all we are all trying to accomplish the goals that our platforms have that we want to do, then I think we need to play by those rules. Um, yeah. So. Anyway, I want to say thank you to Ever for having us. Thank you to Matt Wonderly, Veronica Davis, thank you. Lulu Picard. And yeah, that, that's all. Ever, do you want to take us out or are we just going to end the stream? I don't know. But, th but thank you, everyone. <laughs> no, hey, let's uh, be before we, uh, we end, Roger, I am looking forward to the day when you are a national name, right? When you're recognized nationally 
you, you truly do this well. You have a great platform yourself and being able to kind of do this is not easy, right? But you, you do it so well. And I'm, uh, you know, we've been friends for a while now and I, I love everything you do. You're very creative. You're very compassionate. I'm looking forward to the day when uh, the rest of the, the nation and the world gets to see that as well. So congrats for your success. Congrats for doing this with, uh, with this panel discussion. Thanks, my man. And, uh, you know, ever before we started tonight, he, he's like, I can't, I hate going up against Roger because production value is so high. He's always dressed up and I wasn't going to reveal it, but you know, don't be fooled. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in sweat shorts right here. So yeah. don't be fooled. Guys. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> Lulu, Veronica, Matt, uh, I'm glad that you guys were able to come back. I, I know we tried this at the festival. Uh, what was it a few weeks ago? Um, and 30 minutes was simply not enough. You guys coming in here and, and going in deep was very, very valuable. And I like the fact that, you know, it wasn't a yes kind of a session. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. I, I love that there was a little bit of a uh, uh, back and forth. And, okay. and uh, I think that's very, very valuable, right? We, we like to see different perspectives and respect them, not always agree with them, but still move forward, right? I mean, I think everybody still has good vibes here. And I, I love that yeah. about uh, being able to put these type of events together. So thank mm -hmm. all of you for being a part of it. Um, thank you, I my man. I worked with a guy earlier this year and it, there were some tense conversations around that table. And he said something that has always stuck with me since March. <laughs> he, said, he said, you know, in order to solve anything, we have to keep people at the table. And it really stuck in me. Like if there's someone that you have a different opinion with, it's not going to solve anything if one of you walks away from the table. Mm -hmm. So if if you need to cool down, cool down. If you need to find a common language, find it. But the only way we're going to get through these things is by talking and by listening and by, you know, seeing other perspectives and then maybe not solving it that night, but solving in the shower that night. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You're like, you're like thinking about it. You go, oh, that's, yeah, that's great. And then reaching out and saying, thank you for bringing me to my shower realization. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you Lulu. Letting us do this. Lulu, you, yeah. you remind me of something. It's, it's oh, sorry, I know we're going to. Is it your shower? Yes, you remind me, I got to go take a shower. Thanks. No, um, <laughs> you remind me of parenting, actually, is when we're so, those of us that have children and it's, it's a really hard job. Um, when we get, when, when we really want to just raise our voices at our kids, it's never the best move to yell at them or even talk down to them. But the best way, actually what you were saying is the best way to communicate is to come down to their level and just talk to them and understand them. So yeah. you remind me of that. Thanks yeah, for sharing absolutely. If your kid throws a, tent, a tantrum and you yell at your kid, that just tells your kid that, oh, dad's having a tantrum now too. So I can have one later, <laughs> right? So right. yeah, absolutely get on their level. But anyway, this has been, this was great, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, you guys have been awesome. great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, let's do this again, you right? Uh, awesome. Outlier Podcast Festival 2021. We'll see what that looks like. I'm assuming that the first half is going to be more virtual events, but uh, hopefully we can do this in person uh, at the end of 2021. But uh, again, awesome. Roger, Matt, Veronica, Lulu, thank you so much. Outliers, we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.